1 Samuel 18, again, is just a jumping off point. Um, I think next Sunday we'll end the 1 Samuel section of David's life and head into the 2 Samuel section, which has both faith and failures that we'll be able to witness. What a success in the eyes of God. Four times in chapter 18, you're going to see the word success or successful. Please understand in the Hebrew that you might see at the bottom of your footnotes, the word means wise. To be successful is to be wise. Not wise like Einstein, E equals MC squared, or whatever all that adds up to. Wisdom is to think like God. That is true wisdom, and the only way to be successful. More of that in just a moment. So wisdom equals success. So each time in chapter 18 when you see wisdom, or when you see success or successful, you're really seeing what is called, he acted wisely. He thought it through, and he did what he thought was wise according to God's standards. Now, <clears throat> I equally understand that the world has a view of, of wisdom, of success that is absolutely different than yours and mine, and is not common to you and me. If you look above my head, you're going to see a couple of images. Number one would be uh, the bus as he receives the Super Bowl trophy. Ultimately in sports, that's success, isn't it? To receive the Super Bowl trophy. The next thing you're going to see is the world's view of success in Hollywood to receive an Oscar or the Academy Award. But equally, the next screen is going to show that the world views success sometimes as the accumulation of wealth. That is Hearst Castle in California, which my wife and I have toured twice now. There's four different tours. We've only done two. We've got to get back there two more times to do so. Hearst built that as a monument to his wealth. Another viewpoint of success in our world is the White House. Boy, if you're successful in politics, the epitome of success is to become the president. And another viewpoint of success can be seen, the success in war. This is a 1945 headline out of some paper in Iowa that said, peace, war ends, Japanese accept terms of surrender. So ultimately, the epitome of success in war is to have your foe surrender. Finally, you're going to see Another viewpoint in these days of success, <clears throat> Mr. Whitaker up there from West Virginia, <clears throat> a neighbor of ours, back in 19 or 2002, the day after Christmas, he won this huge, huge $314 million jackpot. And today he's blown it all, every dime. And uh, on that day he thought he was successful. But today, it's just misery for him. So the world's view of success, it's not common to us. It's not something that we're going to experience like them. I'm not an athlete. You're not an athlete. Uh, I'm not an actor. I don't think any of you are actors. We're just common folk. Jane and John Doe, with Christian aside of our name. And so really, if we take the fact that we're Christians seriously, we have to ask the question once again, what is success in God's eyes? <clears throat> Look at Paris Hilton, just to bring up on a current event. <clears throat> this girl was born into wealth, oh my goodness, the Hiltons, they own all the hotels. She has everything, uh, successful, so to speak. She's got the looks, if you like that skinny little thing. <laughs> um, she's got uh, everything at her disposal. And yet just recently, uh, back in 2006, she was caught drinking and driving. She was charged with it. She confessed. She admitted it. She took her lumps. And then she was rash and arrogant enough to believe that she, Paris Hilton, didn't have to do everything the judge asked me to do. And just yesterday or the day before, she's been sentenced to 45 days of regular old jail. Not the country club jail that some of these uh, Hollywood types get to go to. She has to wear the orange jumpsuit and be with the rest of the gals in county prison. 45 days. Even though she looks successful, she is not wise. Whatever word you want to give to her, she is not a wise girl at all. So wisdom, success, what does it look like in God's eyes? David's life is really interesting. Here he is, he's a shepherd boy. Um, he's the last of eight brothers. Uh, the one least likely to succeed in the culture of those days. Um, he's got no money, he's a shepherd boy, he stinks, he smells, he's out with the sheep all the time. 
But all of a sudden, this Samuel, this prophet of the Lord, comes and anoints him to be the next king of Israel, because Saul has wandered away from the Lord. The Lord has taken away his blessings upon Saul. So at the age of 16, 17, 18, somewhere in there, he is now anointed to be the next king of Israel. How awesome is that? And then lo and behold, a few days, a few months later, he gets this errand to run for his daddy, and he goes to the Israel army, and he sees them on one mountaintop and the Philistine army on the other side, and he hears this huge man just mocking God and Israel's army. And he's looking around, and nobody wants to fight this giant who is just defying God and mocking his name. And he goes out there, and as you know, he slays or kills the giant. Great day. And then, like I said last week, to top it all off, he gets to have his best friend come to the service in his life, Jonathan. And he gets to move into the king's castle. So he goes from a shepherd boy to living in the palace, the castle, the wonderful opulence of being a king. And he also gets a wife, and so on and so forth. But here it is. It's like being born again. God entering into our lives, giving us the most magnificent realization that God has now made us one of his own children. It's fabulous. And then we've got to start living the Christian life. And the bumps and the bruises and the struggles and the hardships of life start hitting us as Christians. When some of us were told from a television set or something that if you just become a Christian, your life's going to be perfect. You're going to get wealthy. You're going to get healthy. You're going to get better looking. You're going to have hair grow back up on your head. Everything will be well if you become a Christian. And in reality, we who have experienced the Christian life for a number of years know that anything that goes bad is typically either an assault of the evil one or our own dumb mistakes. Mm -hmm. David, in the next 10 years, after being an anointed king, after killing the giant, after being a hero of Israel, after moving in with the king, and after finding his best friend, and the only woman who's ever going to love him named Michael, he is going to have the worst 10 years of his life. The king is going to try to kill him. He has to lie, cheat, and borrow just to get through life. He has to defend himself with his best friend at times, who eventually always believes him. But he's on the run. He's a king without a castle. And he only has a very few subjects following him. That's the Christian life sometimes. Ups and downs, hardships, struggles, and even some very, very dire things happen to us who are Christians, God children. Why would God allow that to happen? One of the hardest truths of life is we can do all the right things. You can live the Christian life extremely well. But just like 1 Peter chapter 2 said, even though you live such good lives among non-believers, they're going to accuse you of all kinds of false things. They're going to lie about you. They're going to say nasty things about you. So we can do all the right things and still bad things can happen to us. Life can be unfair. And this is the greatest test of our faith. How do we react in these bad times?